Uh, oh, there is a recording. Got it. Yeah. So now you're the, the host now. Yeah, you can okay. share your screen. So I share the screen. Screen. Uh -huh. Start now. What are you Why sharing, not? Per? Hello, Rodrigo. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, so thanks everyone for being here. Welcome to the second journal club. This time we have <clears throat> Professor Per Sandel. Uh, he's going to talk about, uh, well, he has a really optimistic title, which is uh, Quantum Field Theory is a TFT. Okay, so Per, you have like from 40 to 50 minutes. And go on. Now it's good, sorry. Now it's in progress. Yeah, yeah keep going, sorry. So I should start now, okay. Good, so thank you for the invitation to give this talk. Before I go on, the, the audio connection, is it good? Should I speak louder or is it fine? It's fine. Okay. So I will talk about work uh, on uh, basically tire spin gravity, but it has a broader uh, scope. It's trying to understand uh, to what extent we can reformulate quantum field theory using topological field theory methods. And this is based on collaborations with a number of people. I will try to go to Zoom here so I can, uh, over the years actually, in various, in various constellations. I would like to mention, of course, uh, Cesar and Jihao and Felipe who are here in this meeting. Um, uh, and uh, it goes back basically to like almost 15 years ago when we started thinking about this in the context of high-speed gravity, as I said. Uh, the basic idea that it start becoming more clear is that it is about a version of a geometric dynamics where the geometries on which the fields live are symplectic rather than Riemannian. Uh, of course, inside a symplectic manifold, you can construct sub-manifolds that have Riemannian structures. So it's really a theory of gravity extended. Uh, so you have a symplectic manifold S on which Hamiltonians act naturally because you have Hamiltonian vector fields. So the Hamiltonians create a group, okay, G, let's say. Uh, so this is the background, usually. We have fixed Hamiltonians, we have a fixed symplectic structure, and we perturb this structure by switching on typically some function, we usually call it density matrix, but the way we think about it here is a uh, a perturbation. So uh, now, usually we simply postulate the, the time evolution of the state. We have a motion of a quantum state in this geometry. But we think of it here as a perturbation. And now there is an action principle that gives these equations. So this action written in the circle there in the middle is, uh, from the point of view of usual symplectic uh, analytical mechanics, is a meta action, okay? It's a second quantized action. So. If you vary that action, there will be back reactions. So the quantum state will actually back react to the symplectic geometry and Hamiltonians as well that governs its motion. So of course, we all know how it works in gravity. There you have a kind of a fixed metric background. You put matter on it, but as matter moves in a curved space through the variation principle, there will be back reaction to geometry. So it's very similar here, okay? It's simply the fact that there is, as I written in the middle there, an action governing everything. So when you vary this action in one way, you get the motion of the quantum state. And when you vary it in another way, you get the back reaction on the symplectic geometry and the Hamiltonians as well from the quantum state. Okay. So, so you can think of this, uh, if you want, as a form of nonlinear quantum mechanics. Indeed, the, 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 the linearized approximation is Schrodinger equation, okay? But there are perturbations to this equation system. This is, of course, not the first time that people are putting nonlinear terms in Schrodinger equation. But I think what we like here is the fact that it all comes from a universal, you know, uh, variation principle, okay? We don't put anything by hand. Uh, so you're, gonna, <clears throat> you're gonna turn off those nonlinearities, right? Yeah, yeah, we can linearize, yes, yeah. We can go, we have a background, that's the first, I mean, the symplectic manifold, the Hamiltonians, there's nothing, it's just, 
symplectic structure in a bunch of Hamiltonians. We switch on the perturbation. We can declare that to be Schrodinger equation. In fact, you should think of it as the Heisenberg equation, the Liouville equation for the, for the density matrix. And then we, the, the system receives nonlinear corrections. Yeah. Um, this is not what we've been really focusing on. I mean, we, we, we can see it in front of us. I mean, for example, you can ask now pertinent questions such as, will these quant why would the quantum states be normalized, density matrices, etc.? It's a good question, I think. In some linearized regimes where things, why does it have to look probabilistic, the theory, for example? I mean, we can talk, uh, uh, we, we, that, that's really a separate topic here, okay? Uh, so what the, our focus on this instead has been the following that, so there are layers here of algebras, okay? So already the quantum system itself, the background itself is an operator algebra, okay? And on top of that, we build another theory, a, a master theory, okay? And when you quantize that theory, when you, quant when you use this action here, in the middle here, when you quantize it, you, just, you do second quantization. You quantize a separate set of degrees of freedom. So there are layers here of operator algebras. And these operator algebras, they are all in, have a common theme. They're, they're graded, okay? They're operators of different degree. You can think of it a bit like bosons and fermions, but it's important that the degree is really in Z or the natural numbers at least, okay? And uh, the typically the products are associative, but only up to uh, homotopy, meaning that if you try to commute several times, you construct a Jacobi identity, for example, it will typically be broken up to uh, uh, exact terms, okay? So there is a differential in the algebra, okay? That differential squares to zero and it controls the cohomology of that, in the cohomology of that differential, you are associative. But when you go outside the cohomology, you switch on perturbations, you start deforming the Jacobi identities, okay? And hence you can deform the algebra. So you can think of these differential algebras as deformable, if you want, uh, algebras, okay? So uh, I will just throw in through slides about it. There are some very general you know, structures around here that always hold true. Uh, so the DG for differential graded, and then they can be of, of two times. They can be of A infinity or L infinity type. A infinity means that there are, the products are have no definite symmetry property. L infinity means that the products have graded symmetry or anti-symmetry, depending on the parameter, as I will show, okay? So I call A infinite and L infinite algebras. And there is, of course, in a special case here is the ordinary associative algebra with its Lie subalgebra. And the Lie algebra you can exponentiate and get back to the associative algebra. So there is a similar relationship here. You can reconstruct an A infinite algebra from its L infinity subalgebras. Okay. With like the exponentiation. Okay. So a lot of the usual intuition for uh, quantum mechanics, which is essential associative algebras, we can keep in this context. Uh, essentially, what, what is really important, you can keep, okay? If, if something doesn't work in the homotopy context, it's not a good idea, okay? That's the basic message, okay? Um, so there is a graded vector space V, okay? So again, uh, if it's in the application to quantum mechanics, you can think of this as your vertex operators or your operators in quantum mechanics. So clearly, I should maybe say that V itself is generated from a smaller set of fundamental operators. So you take some, you know, your Q and P, let's say, and you build Q squared, P squared, you know, polynomials and so on and so forth. So you are generated from a smaller set of operators, a bigger set of composite operators. We can call them vertex operators, hence a V, or vector space, hence a V, okay? Uh, and then there are error products, okay? Because we are in, living in Chile, so we like to use the letter R, 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 okay, products, okay. So R stands for rank, okay. So you take R, cop, R copies of V, and you simply map it back to V, okay. And these maps are R linear, a rank R, multilinear maps, okay. And there is a hierarchy. R is one, two, three, four, five, okay. The first one, the most important one in some sense, M one squares to zero always. And again, in different applications, it will typically turn out to be the BRST operator. Now it's the BRST operator of that underlying system, okay? And uh, it's square to zero. So that's a, a simple equation, okay? Then you have a binary operation. So again, if you go to the underlying system, they typically come from the three-point functions. And 
here everything is smooth sailing. You have Leibniz rule. So what I've written there in black, M1 ring M2 plus minus M2 ring M1 is shorthand for the fact that if I, the first term means that if I first apply M2, I multiply two objects and then differentiate them to the differential. It's the same thing as the second term, first differentiating and then multiplying. Of course, then you have to act on the two factors. So one have to beef up this notation a bit, but it's kind of rigorous in them, okay? But it looks nice at least. M1 ring M2 plus minus M2 ring M1 is here. The plus and minus here again goes with additional gradings involved, okay? So that's details we can filter out, okay? But the, the essence is that you have a Leibniz rule, okay? You can compute happily and start differentiating products, okay? No problem. But then uh, comes uh, 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 the, the interesting part that the associativity or the Jacobi identity doesn't hold in general. It's broken by terms that are vanishing in the cohomology of M1. So remember this M1 is always here. There's always a cohomology in this space. You can always figure out the cohomology uh, of M1 in this space. But Bert, Sorry? I thought that you were on L infinity. So why uh, that Jacobi identity uh... Shouldn't be like uh, a... it's associated. It depends. Okay, good. So if this product, I, I put it here in the end. If these products are totally symmetric or graded symmetric or graded unsymmetric, it's called an L infinity algebra. If there, there is no symmetry, it's called an A infinity algebra. But the equations look the same. Okay. Yeah, but the, that algebra is not the the cohomology, right? It's is the algebra of of V, right? I mean, because you yeah, have so 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 you have if you have a space V. With a differential, I should say maybe here that actually is written somewhere here. You can see it from this equation coming up. I will use the pointer here on my, uh, hang on a second, here. You see here that the, if you put R is one here, the degree of M1 is one, it's a differential. So you can figure out the cohomology of this of this map in this space V, okay? Okay, yeah, sorry. I mean, you, that of course in, in a given case can be really, really difficult, but there is a cohomology, okay? <laughs> Yeah, it's just that the Jacobi so looks you, looks like standard Jacobi. Yeah, so this is this is the Jacobiator or associator, okay? Okay. This piece here, okay? And here you have M1 on a new product that would take three elements, okay? Or the, that new product acting on uh, uh, M1 on its factors, okay? So this identity here, you should act on three elements, okay? So if I could delete these terms here, if I can throw away anything that's proportional to M1, that's this term, or if I can set M1 on stuff to zero, that's this term. So if you can delete these two terms, I mean the cohomology, then you have associativity. But when you don't, when you go outside of the cohomology, which you of course have to do without perturbations, then uh, 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 you, you, you still control the violation of the associated with these terms, you see? It's the controlled deformability, okay? It's not an arbitrary violation of... So, of, uh, mm -hmm. the L infinity algebra is not for the operator, right? Because you have, you, the generalized uh, Jacobi for, the, the L infinity generalized Jacobi is not what you call word identity there. Yeah, so indeed. So here, when you violate associative, so there is a clear hierarchy, there's a differential, there is a, a Leibniz rule, everything is, you know, as usual, when you come to the associator, it's like perturbation theory, right? Then you say, oops, I don't have associativity, but it's up to homotopies, okay? It, it, it's, it's terms that can be thrown away in the cohomology. Then you have to introduce this M3, okay? When, when you have M3, then you have to ask, how do I compose M3 with M2 or with M, you know? And then you get this general set of relations here, okay? Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm sketching here with the signs and, okay, but it just means that for example, if you write this out explicitly, uh, M1, there is an M4, right? So M, uh, M, M3 with M2 will involve an M1 with an M4, okay? And so on and so forth. And these are just the word identities of the underlying quantum system, okay? So if you have a good uh, quantum mechanical system, you should expect these kind of identities to pop up. This is almost, uh, uh, would say, an axiom, okay? Uh, there are, of course, possibilities of going beyond this, uh, but we, we are going to work within this, this, in some sense, the master equation here. And the degrees here of these maps are all fixed, okay? The intrinsic degrees. So, for example, if I put R to R to 1, M1 is degree 1, which we all expect. It should be, for example, uh, it could be Dirham differential on a commutative manifold. And, in fact, uh, maybe I should add it immediately. If you want to do Dirham cohomology, you can derive the RAM cohomology with you know the standard you know 
differential geometry book that I'm calling from underlying quantum systems as well. Okay, because I've been working, for example, with Cesar and Alexander. Now. There are actions that give you uh, as a semi classical limit the standard Ram commodity. Okay, you don't need uh, you know type A and B models and uh, Calabiao and stuff like that. It's not necessary. You can just do it with a simple sigma model. And then the products when when the rank goes up, the degree goes down. Okay, and that's kind of natural because we want to apply these products to a chain of uh, fields. Okay, and the fields should have in quote unquote positive degree. Okay. So if I apply MR to R objects that all have sufficiently positive degrees, the total product it can have a fixed degree, okay? As we will see on the next slide, okay? And there is a parameter here that's very important, this P hat. So it's because the underlying, I didn't mention, I didn't stress it here, but these vertex operators here come from an underlying AKZ topological field theory in P hat plus one dimensions. So for example, if you put yourself in one plus one dimension and AKZ topological string, p hat is one, you put one there, okay? And then you get two minus r, okay? And then you see that when you put r to two, two minus two is zero, so the binary product has intrinsic degree zero. And then you feel home, right? So again, if I put p hat to one, r to two, then the m2 has degree zero, it looks like a quote unquote matrix product or an ordinary operator product. So indeed the strings here are particularly interesting because when you quantize the string, the first quantize these strings, you get standard quote unquote associative algebras where the differential again has degree one, the binary product has degree zero, and you can think of it as uh, an ordinary, you know, uh, uh, garden variety quantum algebra. When p hat is greater than one, uh, you start having negative degree already in the binary product. So the fundamental field has to be at least a two form, okay, or something with degree two. But this is. This, of course, just general abstract nonsense, right? What I'm doing here. I mean, this is just general structure. If you have this in your hand, you should try to use what you can squeeze out of it. So what can we squeeze out of this? Uh, we could, for example, we can, as I said, I can take the symmetric part of these products, okay? Uh, and get L infinity brackets. I'm not gonna go through into any detail there, but we're gonna stick typically to the A infinity case, okay? That's already quantum algebra, okay? Uh, there is the two point function here. Life started with the, 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 somewhere here, the three point functions, okay? There was a BRST operator, stylistically speaking. Uh, so what about the two point functions? So they're a bit special. They pop up instead in this abstract formulation as the bilinear form, okay? It's a map from V times V to C, okay? And uh, in fact, if uh, in, in the unital case, when the, when the algebra contains a unit, you can think of this as a trace. You simply put a one here with an element X here. So the bilinear form pairing between one and X is that you define to be the trace of X. So then I can drop this tedious you know, square brackets and write traces everywhere, okay? In the unit of case. And indeed most of the cases I'm looking at are unitals. We can write trace all the time. Good. Uh, and this bilinear form should be, depending on this B hat, it should be symmetric or unsymmetric, graded, okay? And it has also an intrinsic degree, okay? And it can be either odd or even. Here I'm starting to get sloppy, partially because, you know, uh, these are the kind of things you derive only once in your life, right? But then you forget them, I don't know how many times you have to derive, but typically the degrees here are some negative numbers, which are even or odd, okay, depending on P hat. Okay, so I could have, it, it, I mean, you can think of, again, this as if it was Dirac cohomology, this is just the integral, right? You simply, in, it's simply the trace of the Dirac cohomology, which is the integration of the manifold, okay? Which has a negative intrinsic degree, okay? You, you, you take away, you know, you send the P form to a real number, positive P goes to R. So it has typically negative intrinsic degree, but it could be positive, I mean, in the abstract sense. Then if you have this, uh, then you build a master field. You simply take your generators. I call them here E alpha. They are the basis vec vectors of V, right? We have a space V, the basis vectors. I call them E alpha. Uh, and I multiply them by some coefficients, Z alpha. So these coefficients live in themselves now in a graded space, okay? So again, the elements here in V, these Vs, they had some degree, right? Every basis element in a graded space has a degree. But we can multiply them by numbers complex numbers that we also assign degree. So that two degrees here, there is the first quantized degree here and the second quantized degree there, okay? I call it G for ghost number, okay? 
Good. Uh, so the total degree of Z, I can then fix. For example, if a generator here has degree, let's say one, I can give uh, this number degree zero, so that the total degree is zero. If this has degree minus one, I can put the two form here, or two, degree two number here, to have a total degree one. So I can fix the total degree of Z, okay? And again, we typically fix it to something odd when P hat is odd and something even, P hat is even, okay? And then you, you, you simply blurt out the master action, okay? So it's, uh, as you can see, very simple. It's just you summing a quadratic term, Z, M, one, Z, okay? And one third, Z, M, two, Z, Z, and so on and so forth, okay? I should mention maybe here, I didn't say it. I should have written here. Uh, I, I'm not gonna edit my slide in front of you, but I should written here an invariant bilinear form. So if I put the product on one side, I can move, I, I can move the arguments around, okay? It's an invariant bilinear form, okay? Good. So with that additional invariance assumption on the bilinear form, you get a lot of things for free, okay? Uh, it's gauge invariant, it's the action. Again, up to total derivatives, which honestly speaking of in, in the real model, is really important, the total derivatives here. I mean, so it's gauge invariance of shell and uh, up to uh, uh, boundary conditions, okay? And you have on shell, when you vary this action, you get the field equation. I haven't written down here, but it looks very simple. It's simply M1 of Z or the differential on Z plus M2, ZZ, the product of Z with itself, M3, ZZZ plus, okay, no, 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 that's zero. That equation has Bianchi identities. That means that you can in integrate the field equations in, you know, by perturbing the, which is amounts to perturbing this commodity, okay? And maybe even more interestingly, you can also do, you can do a path integral now. This, this serves as a good path integral measure. So you can do a BV perturbation expansion. So what you're quantizing now is not V. V is already quantized. It was already there from the beginning, you know. We had obtained it, let's say, from a quantum mechanical you know, manifold, okay? Hey, uh, so now you're doing it. Was that a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you are in the RAM, uh, shouldn't that manifold? The, the manifold on which you're going to integrate will be the asymplectic one, or because you put as a condition to have a asymplectic structure, right? And you have higher. Yes, yes. So I, if I go back to my first slide here, what's going on? You, you think, of course. So V, the, 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 this manifold here, I'm, this is slide also in the future, but the, this manifold here, the, the functions on this man or this symplectic manifold, the algebra of functions is V, okay? Okay. Yeah, it's just right. because you have but, the natural pairing that you have is between Z and D Z, but you have also Z and Heiger, uh, D Heiger M, sorry, Z, right? That's not symplectic. Oh, the, so, so the, okay, no, yeah. So if I have, yes. So when I say, that's true. So when I say symplectic here, the simplest examples, you have a background that's just, you have just a binary product, okay? But okay. you can, but you can deform such systems, so switch on, higher products. So indeed, many of the things, okay. So, okay. so this algebra, I, I should be really uh, uh, try to say, so this algebra V here, it typically consists, is a typically product itself of two other algebras. It's a product of forms on a manifold, okay? There you have only, as you say, uh, 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 it's symplectic, there's only binary product and a differential, the drum differential. Then the other factor is an internal A infinity algebra. Okay. So V here can itself be factorized. It's built like from, it's a composite algebra. You can think of it a bit like differential forms valued in a Lie algebra. The forms themselves, before you make them valued in anything, form an algebra. We have wedge product and drum differential. That's one factor of V. The other factor is some internal algebra. So, uh, so indeed, uh, uh, when we start in, in, in the symplectic case here, uh, in the symplectic manifold, on the manifold itself, you have an ordinary graded, differential graded associative algebra. No homotopy, just associative. But the forms are valued in some internal algebra that we take to be a typically finite dimensional A infinity algebra, okay? Okay, thank you. And the product of forms with that internal algebra is V, okay, here. So, so, so in the end, one lands here, okay? So the, the, in other words, the E alphas here have a substructure. Here you have a form valued in an internal algebra. 
and the internal algebra has the basis, the forms has the basis. You simply introduce off shell a set of the basis of functions, okay, on your manifold, call them F. I, let's say, and then you have a basis of uh, gen internal generators TR, okay? E alpha is then FI tensor TR, okay? So alpha is a composite index. Alpha is I comma R, okay? Alpha V is a direct product space and the base is direct product, okay? Then one rely, I didn't put it here, but that theorem is saying that you can always tensor A infinity algebras. If you have two A infinity algebras, the tensor product makes sense, okay? Because again, that's one of the features that you survive. We all know how to tensor associative algebras, I think, right? We just take direct products of matrices. But you can also tensor uh, infinity algebras. Okay. So I was trying to keep it simple here. Uh, but, okay. But it's a good question indeed. Yeah. So these kind of theories here, you can do perturbation expansion. Okay. Uh, and, and now what you quantize is this set of numbers here. I mean, these coefficients here. So they are like classical numbers, they're like complex numbers, let's say, or actually like graded complex numbers as are written here, okay? So they behave as just numbers in this action, okay? But when you turn the crank of BV, Batal and Vilkovisk and Perturbis, they turn into operators themselves, okay? I can put the little hat here. They become quantized. So now you're doing quote unquote second quantization, okay? So you have the, the gauge theory itself lives in V, meaning that the quote unquote field here, the master field, is an element of V, but it's kind of valued in the semi-classical algebra that in itself becomes quantized, okay? So now you're quantizing these dual, okay? So uh, I'm looking here at my uh, egg clock. My egg is hard boiled by this time. <laughs> uh, uh, good, so I will try to now, with the time that I have left, to uh, highlight a few features of this. And then uh, if you allow me, I could maybe skip long into the this talk because i would like to illustrate precisely this point which i've been working on here recently with philip and others uh, and i can immediately tell you that what we are trying to do okay this framework here one can adapt precisely with indices and everything space to vasilev's theorem of Heisman gravity okay good then these are uh, vasilev's master fields that are packaged in here okay and these are forms on a manifold, okay, non commutative geometry. And the numbers that we use when we do, when, when someone says, I'm working with higher spin gravity, typically his fields or his coefficients are classical numbers, right? But we can, we would like to quantize this. In particular, I would like to put my finger here on coefficients that are creation and annihilation operators of uh, massless particles. And I want to quantize them, okay? I want them to appear in a, in a, second quantized or maybe a second quantized algebra with precise commutation rules okay so we have to do something we can't just take Vasilev's theory it's a class it's a non-commutative geometry but it's a classical D theory so we have built now this is the results obtained particularly with, with Philippe a, a way to uh, uh, put the Poisson structure or to quantize that theory okay so that means that we have an action of this form uh, with more details of course uh, and uh, particular products, okay, that achieves, okay. Good, uh, but let me, since this is the kind of general talk, just stress a few of the general features of this formalism that, that I find personally to be the most interesting ones, maybe. Uh, so qualitative features more than that. So the first one is that when we deal with this, we, were, we are led in the direction of multiple perturbative expansions. So you can compare this with alpha prime and G string expansion in string theory. So string theory, there's a first quantized perturbative expansion, and there's alpha prime, the world sheet version of H bar, and then there is a target space or a space time Planck's constant, you should call G string. So you do two perturbative expansions. Okay, so there's first quantization and second quantization. So that's the feature also of this formalism here, okay, which makes everything interesting because that means that when you're doing a classical field theory in G string, you're still having an underlying first quantized uh, quantum field theory. So you're working on a non commutative geometry. Okay. So that means that when you take the classical limit of the operator algebra at one layer, let's say if I take the classical limit of this operator algebra, then I go back to this classical field theory here. Okay. So then a the second quantized field theory becomes a classical field theory, right? So this operation uh, means that, or, or this classical field theory 
uh, is governed by this. Okay, is governed by an operator algebra. But the classical fields here are elements in an operator algebra with underlying first quantized fields here. Okay, and you can think of now this classical field theory again the equations of motion that would follow from varying this action as uh, non-linear uh, quantum mechanics. Okay, on. Uh, 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 with with the target space given by this S and T star of these groups. So remember my first slide, I had a symplectic manifold S. I'm going to stick to that one. That was also a group, okay? So in this manifold here, which is the target space of the first quantized field theory, um, we are uh, 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 putting a nonlinear theory. And the action, in fact, the action I had there is this one here. It gives you nonlinear corrections to quantum mechanics. So that I, I find really personally very, you know, attractive and interesting because again we are not putting non-linearities in the quantum mechanics here in a in, in a phenomen phenomenological sense which actually one would like to do okay so when you go to read phenomenolo phenomenology papers on non-linear quantum mechanics people know what they are doing because they have you know experiments supporting them but it becomes a bit kind of chaotic but whereas here we are resting on a much more tight set of rules okay Good. Uh, and in particular, uh, Vasilev's high spin gravity in this context, you can think of as nonlinear quantum mechanics of the conformal particle of Dirac. Okay. So, a long time ago, uh, in fact, I know when it was, it's 54 years ago, because it was the same year that I was born, Dirac wrote a paper about the conformal particle. Okay. It's a really cute little quantum mechanical system. Okay. It's a particle living on a cone. In a space with two times, okay. I think we all know that right? that the Bendix space of Antisiter, okay. And uh, and this you can also think of as string partons, okay. If you take an ADS string, you cut it to pieces, you switch off tension, you get partons, and they behave like conformal part. So Vasilis high spin gravity, we can think of as the non-linear quantum mechanics of the Dirac's conformal particle in this sense that I tried to outline about. Okay. So this way we keep the bag together, okay, of ideas. Uh, good. The second, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, feature that's kind of generic here is non-commutative geometry. Okay, uh, so uh, what 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 we have learned, so to say, is that the operator algebra. So when we say we have quantum mechanics, we say let's say, okay, I have what I have. I have my Q's and T's. Okay, you build operators typically. Uh, uh, let's say the vacuum vacuum projector, let's say, or you use some other, uh, the Hamiltonians, that typically relatively, uh, 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 that, let's say, globally defined operators, okay? But what we've discovered here through looking at high spin geometry, the high spin geometries or the high spin solutions to the Vasily theory are operator algorithms that, that are sometimes topologically non trivial. That means that uh, when you move around in this geometry, you locally, you, you, you Locally, you coordinateize your operator algebra using symbols. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that you have an operator algebra which is like a manifold; it's an abstract entity. Okay, it consists of points. Okay, each point is an operator, and then you can locally map points or operators to more concrete objects, which are symbols. Okay, so I have it here. Okay, so the symbols are this here. The symbols are distributions on this manifold M, okay? The manifold M here is the target space, again, of uh, the first quantum system. So you have a non commutative manifold, you have a star product on it, and so on and so forth. You put distributions on this manifold with a non-local composition rule, okay? And here, where it gets very technical and hard to grab it, I'm sure all of you must have seen at least a few times, there are these star products, uh, but to, be, to make, the precise point, those star products are local representatives of a globally defined operator algebra, okay? So what happened is that this operator algebra, I can, this bar means here, I can zoom in on a subsector of this algebra, I can take out, you can think of the algebra as a big vector space with corners. So I zoom in on a corner, I create a map from this subsector using symbols to distributions on a manifold. So what we discovered here is that now that topological non-trivialities, when you move around in this algebra, sometimes you, you, the simplest thing you can have is like the analog of a helix, for example. You go around in the algebra, then you come back to the same point where you started, but your symbol has gone to, the symbol goes to minus itself, okay? It's a bit like the square root function, really honestly. 
square root of z in Yomi, right? You, the, the, the square root of z, you represent locally the square root of r, the radius in complex plane, exponential i theta over 2, right? And theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, okay? But then when you go around and theta jumps, then that local description flips sign, whereas the square root function is, of course, analytical and continuous, okay? So these, if you have that in mind, and you go and start studying high spin geometries, we've learned this, that to have a well-defined geometries, you really have to have analytical continuations of operator algebras. And that's very helpful to think of this little diagram here. You have the abstract algebra. Locally, you coordinate the symbols with this non sorry, with these non-local composition rules, and you get not topologically non-trivial operator algebras that way. Okay? Hey, but so, me, uh, warning. I'm just here. Sorry? A minute warning. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, good. So, uh, uh, so here that we have the uh, the, 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 the sector, okay, the sector, I said there's some boundary. So the, again, this manifold M here, inside this manifold, which is a non the manifold, there are sub-manifolds, which are really space times, okay? And in that, those space times, you can zoom in on regions which are asymptotically local anti sector, okay? And uh, so to study such solutions, of course, that built in, on this big manifold M, there are non-commutative holomorphic symplectic geometries. So these are very interesting. Uh, the, the, the symplectic structure now is not just real. The usual symplectic manifold that all of us know is R2, right? Q and P, but these are holomorphic symplectic. So Q and P are actually complex variables, okay? So in these kind of geometries, since there's a complex structure, you can take the real part or Z and Z bar and you can construct separately holomorphic or chiral uh, uh, star product subalgebras. And these you can analytically continue, okay? Here we are uh, uh, working right now with Carl and David, we are about to publish. So we discovered here that the proper way to formulate this is again through this kind of, uh, to distinguish it, the operator algebra from its symbol. I think that me personally, at least for a long time, I made this kind of mistake of thinking of the symbols as the actual algebra, you see? But they are just the local descriptions of well of of, uh, 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 of global defined structure. Okay, it's about as confusing as if you were trying to understand square root of z as an analytic function. You write it as r square root of r e to the i t over two, and somebody tells you that theta goes from zero to two pi. Right? You say, oops, what happens here when I go back? You know, when I jump from two pi to zero, my function is seems discontinuous. But it's not, of course. You have to get to go to a new coordinate chart. Okay. So this has been painful, I can tell you, okay? But it, it, that's how it should be done, okay? Then what's interesting now, I want to say, this is the second feature of non commutative geometry. What's interesting now is that once your field theory, once your classical field theory, I will go back one step here. So once your classical field theory itself is an operator algebra, then you can maybe imagine that, and if that classical field theory contains in it gauge fields, in particular gravity, okay, a metric or a frame field, okay, and other well known, so to say, uh, uh, classical gauge theory fields, there are many singularities that we encounter in classical gauge theory. I mean, the most famous ones is, of course, the Coulomb singularity, right, in the electric field, the Schwarzschild singularity, which is closely related actually, and you have also uh, domain walls. Uh, FL, FRLW type of singularities. There are BTZ-like singularities where there is no vial tensor blowing up, but nonetheless, the causal structure is singular. All these structures, all these classical gauge theory singularities that are listed here, not we can lift them up or we can put them inside high spin gravity, okay? And now, not just from, this is the big surprise, they're resolved, okay? The, the operator algebra, this globally defined algebra is totally well defined. There is no singularity. So when you say, oops, I mean, the electric field becomes infinite or the wild tensor becomes infinite or the geodesics run out of, you know, uh, space, in the operator algebra, there is no singularity, okay? It's just the property of, uh, where I have it here, of this distribution of this symbol here, okay? This is just a local feature. So that I would like to really stress, I think that if one changes perspective, you think of non-commutative geometry as the fundamental description in these asymptotically local IDS regions, of course, there are things becomes weakly coupled. So you can kind of switch, you can tailor expand all these non-commutative coordinates if you want and remove them from your table 
of equations. And then it looks like ordinary field equations. And fine. I mean, that's some totally low, there is no real singularity. But when you come close to the singularity, you know, then you have to lift everything to the upper right related algorithm, and the singularities are resolved. Okay. So that's a, a feature that comes from the fact we deal with non complete geometry. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, we push one more slide here, then, okay. Uh, and the final uh, feature that uh, you know defines in something or, or key is that we're dealing here with uh, topological theories, but that de defect, okay? Defect meaning that then you think of the manifold that you map in topological field theory. There's this uh, language that you start from a manifold without any structure on it. Typically, you have boundaries. That manifold is mapped to an algebraic entity, okay? If there are many boundaries, you get a tensor with one index for each boundary. That's the way a mathematician thinks of the quantum field theory, okay? A manifold with boundaries, each boundary is mapped to a vector space, and hence the whole manifold with all its boundaries is mapped to a tensor with many indices, or we're state in a tensor product, okay? Uh, so here, what we are adding on here to this, or it's not just us, I mean, it's ongoing research in TFT, is the, this idea of defects. So not just boundaries are important, but you can have co-dimension two or three or high co-dimension substructures on the manifold. And to these uh, uh, sub these sub manifolds, you attach your degrees of freedom, okay? So what we're playing with here, maybe it was, I don't know if it was so clear from above, but those that field Z there, that index alpha, it's not innocent. It's not just alpha goes from one to N, it's really an infinite dimensional index, okay? We have infinite dimensional uh, Cartan integral systems, okay? There are infinite dimensional systems of forms, okay, involved here. A sub I mean, that V is factorizable and a factor of V is a differential form alpha on a non commutative manifold. So these are the infinitely many differential forms. So such a theory with infinitely many differential forms can actually describe what you would usually call a local degree of freedom, okay? Or to be more precise, a, a mass shell, let's say, okay? Of a, of, a, of, a, of a massless particle. So such a degree of freedom can appear inside a topological system simply because you deal with infinite dimensional sets of forms, okay? It's really that simple, okay? Well, I mean, uh, the details are good, but the idea is that simple. Every differential form comes with a typically finite number of degrees of freedom, but since you multiply by infinity, you get infinitely many, okay? So when people say you cannot use topological field theory to ordinary code because it's wrong, I mean, just might have to put defects. I might have to deal with this. Okay. Of course, uh, the, the the nice TFTs that one people could would like is other one where you have finite many fields because then it's all well defined. But we are physicists, so we have to deal with ill-defined things, or we have to try to define ill-defined things. Hence, we use uh, 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 we try to use this framework here. Okay. At least it gives together with DGAs. A framework for actually trying to define what it's all about, okay? QFT. Um, so we attach this, and this sounds maybe this attached thing here, it's an important verb here in this sentence. How to actually attach a degree of freedom to a defect? Well, you have to take the differential form algebra and you have to uh, put boundary conditions at the defect, okay? You, you may even put some fields to zero there, okay? Typically, you, you split the fields into coordinates and momenta, quote unquote, okay? There is this. I didn't, I didn't stress it above, but that term there, that Z, M1, Z, the kinetic term typically has a polarization, okay? So you can split that Z variable into one half, call them X, and another half, call them P, okay? And you put the momenta to zero on your defect. That's a good thing to do, okay? And then the X is restricted to the defect, become expandable on coefficients, okay? And those coefficients generate an operator algebra, which is infinite dimensional, okay? And in that operator algebra, again, I'm, I will go back there so I can point to what I'm talking about. Okay, so, uh, so this variable Z here, the leading term here is Z, M1, Z. That term very often you can split, okay? So you can write this, you can write Z as a sum of two pieces. In other words, the space V here, you can write as a direct sum of two pieces. There's a polarization, okay? And then this can write the leading term as P M one X, okay? Or P Q dot, if you want. Mm -hmm. And then you put momenta to zero on the defect. You zoom in the coordinates there. So a subset of V, the one having to do with X becomes quantized, okay? So you attach an operator algebra to that defect, okay? 
So that we can, again, if you, in, in, in simple models, in particular in, in low dimensions, this can be done precisely, okay? We are doing it in high spin gravity the best we can, okay? And then what's important now is that if you go and read the TFT, uh, the original paper by Atiya, uh, there is a snag in that paper in that he has a very rigorous definition of TFT. So what happened is that if your manifold has, let's say, two boundaries, and you glue these boundaries together, so you get the torus, or you get the circle across the manifold, let's say, then the, 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 the TFT should assign that manifold a number, okay? And in fact, in the original difference without defects, the number will be the dimension of the operator algebra attached to the bound, original boundary, okay? Okay, you say, wait a minute, so if, my, if I have an infinite dimensional operator algebra, then I should assign infinity to a closed manifold. That doesn't make sense. So if you think of it that way, then you have to find a dimensional operator algebra, find a dimensional Hilbert spaces, okay? But the way out here is that if you think of the boundaries as defects instead, you can attach something called here partial actions. There are additional functionals I can attach now to the defects, okay? So there is a, I wrote it above, there was this S, that S you can think of as the bulk action. Now you can attach additional actions uh, to the defects. We call them K here, okay? Uh, and- You have two minutes. Uh, uh, and I, sorry? You have two minutes. Yeah. Uh, so the, the defects here can include the defects here can include asymptotic local metric spaces in particular, okay? So these functions here can have perturbative expansions that look pretty similar to ordinary uh, uh, perturbatively defined gravitational actions, okay? And this can be, this can also be done in the context of the AKZ path interval. I'm not gonna go into the detail here, but uh, this, these are local functionals that can be dealt with in the standard set, okay? Good, so, uh, I have here, this will be the last thing I'll go through then, okay. So, uh, so now, uh, uh, the kind of math involved here is that, so you have a non-commutative geometry, okay, with two Ms, it's important, uh, and it has to be defect. It means that on that geometry, you're putting sub-manifolds. So here there is, so remember here, all the underlying first quantized system, okay? So uh, the defects must give rise to well-defined subalgebras of this operator. The op operator algebra V lives here already, okay? And if you can do that, uh, then each defect you map to an operator algebra, okay? And uh, if you have several defects together, you get an entangled state, okay? So this is a given surface with a given, given defect structure. The map here is induced by uh, this non commutative topological field theory. And the end result is a state, a new state. It's built in this algebra V star. I should have written that maybe here. This vacuum is built, it's an operator in the V star algebra. So here I should have written V, and here you have a V star algebra element, okay? And the, the arrow here, the, you know, what does this? What does the trick? I don't have to do it by hand, okay? This is called sometimes a functor because there are properties on this. It's kind of, a, this is like a group-like structure. Actually. You can glue together, for example, manifolds, etc. It acts like you can compose objects here, and then you can compose states here. It's like if I contract the uh, two boundaries, it's like contracting two tensors over here, okay? So functor is just a statement uh, where we use when uh, you have a group-like structure mapped to another group-like structure, like an isomorphism, okay? So this also is used by this uh, non commutative T. And what's important here, the last thing I stress in the minute I have left is that now uh, uh, th this, this is a non commutative field theory, but it's star product local, okay? What do we mean by that? It means that uh, if I go back here, this action I written somewhere, where was it? Here, okay. It looks very formal, but, but if you start writing it more precisely, you will see that there is no, the only non-locality in here is from the fact that you're multiplying together operators and operators, if you remember, are mapped here to uh, distributions with non-local composition rules. These composition rules here are sometimes called star products, okay? So the only non-locality in the theory is that coming from these star products. There is no additional non-locality. In other words, 
in the action, in that in the in the den action density, the one you use to give the path integral measure, the only non-locality you tolerate are those coming from star products or these R array maps. Okay. There's no additional derivatives or anything. So that means that and you can actually prove that this form of locality is tolerable when you do BV quantization. Um, in other words, if I have if you drop all form of locality assumptions on actions and observables in battalion field quantization, then kind of anything goes, okay? Everything becomes trivial, okay? You need to have a very well defined notion of what is a local function. In a TFT, which is commutative, it will be an action built from wedge products and the RAM differentials. Here, I build them from star products and uh, the RAM differentials, okay? So this is the kind of action we use to do this map here. So this, uh, uh, hence, supersedes space and locality, okay? That has been an ongoing issue for quite some time in high-spin gravity that uh, it appears that if you try to take Vasiliev's theory, for example, and you treat it as a standard Fronstadt theory with the you, know, with, uh, you, you try to project it down to space-time and quantize it there, all goes wrong, okay? It becomes totally non-local, okay? But if you do it this way, you land within this class of theories I'm trying to outline here. And I would claim that everything is then fine, okay? And also what is superseded here is holography. So these geometrically entangled states here, there are many different types of defects. So I, over, the, over time, uh, I would just like to, to stress that we can now think of holography in a, 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 a new level, okay? There are certain defects which are, uh, that called fractional spin gravities, okay? There are really modified CFTs, whereas the other defects in high co dimension, which is Vasiliev's theory, so, so Vasiliev's theory and its quote unquote holographic dues are both defects appearing in a, in, a, in a higher theory, namely the one I sketched about, okay? Good, so I will stop here, Felipe. Uh, ready for questions, if any. Uh, okay, so I think we can, uh, thanks, Per. Maybe you can guys like clap react if you want. Uh, so thank you, Per, for the- Clap your hands. <laughs> Throw in right. your coins, yeah. For the nice talk. Uh, if well, Rod is giving like that. So if you guys have any question, please you can just commit yourself. Well, I have a question. Very is nice. There anybody out there? Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rodrigo. When you mention word identities, usually word identities depends on you having an action principle and you are some sort of studying some. Uh, quantum field theory, but also you have a path integral. What is the path integral in this case? Because you start from basically the beginning of the, you didn't yeah, that's have- why I put the parentheses here, because you could just- theory. Yeah. So, so, so here I went- identities? Yes, I was, no, indeed, there is an underlying uh, TFT with an action and it's word identities give you this identity here. Yes. So what I'm doing here, I'm, so you take an action, say first quantize, you quantize it. Now you have an operator algebra. That operator algebra will have these features outlined here. Now you use that theory to build a new action. This is like the second quantize one. And you quantize now the dual, okay? So then it's, so you might say, how do, okay. So how do I do, so here becomes a, a chicken and egg problem. So I will simply say, well, where does everything start? Okay, this theory itself, the underlying theory has the same structure. So that should be a, if there's, there should be zero quantization, right? And my, I mean, so how many quantizations do we have? And if I second quantize, I should third quantize. So that, that's indeed a very interesting problem. Where do we start here, okay? But I mean, in the, if it's, for example, if this was string field theory, then the word identities we would be those of the world sheet, okay? The world sheet uh, 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 action, okay? If I do it with the uh, AKZ, the strings, these are the word identities of the of the two, two, one plus one dimensional uh, topological field theory. So there is a, there is, so I put in the bracket, I, I, it's not, I could have started here and say, how to describe such an algebra? I start from an from a AKZ field theory, but then I have to explain to you what is an AKZ field theory. Then I have to start from an operator algebra. So that's of course an interesting question here. It's kind of a philosophical one. Where does this stop? Or should we maybe, what I think actually happens here is that everything is just a circle, you see? Maybe third quantization should be identified with zero quantization. So you have zero, one, two, and three, you see? There's like a sequence of quantizations that all tie together, okay? 
Now, in a, what what we I mean, what most of us usually do when we want to define a string, we simply declare there is a Riemann surface, there is a field x mu, and uh, uh, so on. Right? We, we just we just write down an action without thinking about it. Right? I mean, okay, we think about some or Einstein-Hilbert action. There is a space-time m4, you know, with a metric on it. There's no need to think about uh, first quantization to write down Einstein's theory. Okay, but what we're doing here is that we are really inducing from one level of quantization the next layer okay and hence i the previous layer should have the same structure as the next layer okay there should be really copying of structure okay that's the principle here so that becomes clearly uh, uh, as i said it's like a chicken and egg problem where, where do we start and where do we end okay sorry about this i will okay well but we now have another comment Usually, when you mm -hmm. apply this first quantization, second quantization, uh, you are talking about particles, fields, and third quantization will be metric or geometry. It, yes, I mean the third quantization not. here would essentially be when, I mean, I mean here you go from n to n plus one. Okay, so the space v here, this is what you can call it of an n quantized system, then the dual is the n plus one quantization then you then you must build composites of the dual right you will build composites okay i didn't go through it here but you have to build invariant you have to build observables local local functionals from the z field okay so these will be composite operators which are generated by the coefficients z alpha here where is this uh, so you take you have some composite operators which are functions of the z alpha in there then you can call that v v say hat okay v n plus one and then you recycle and you recycle and recycle okay so the idea here would be that ideally you should i mean this n goes to n plus one should be like a, almost a triviality so then you should close it i mean i would like to identify actually i mean the first quantized theory is that we write down say the particle could actually come the the zero quantization could be the third quantization of another system or of the same system okay that would be more elegant right it's like asking the question there is no you know, there's no boundary in the universe. It's the same thing here. When you quantize, should just be one one big quantum algebra, okay? V, V dual, and so on and so forth. And it forms one entity, okay? I'm thinking about it also, how to do it concretely, but okay. But again, in the truth, to be, so for example, to build Vasily, when Vasiliev wrote down his equations in 89, 90, he introduced forms, operator algebras, etc. okay? Just by hand, right? Uh, what we're trying to do, hence, is that, okay, we try to explain where those came from. These operator algebras came from a first quantized system. To write down that first quantized system, also have to write down an operator algebra. It has to live in one plus one dimension. Where does that come from? And I would like that to really come from a similar procedure, you see? <laughs> so that's, uh, but this is more of a, you know, philosophical issue. But the straight answer to the question, yes, there are, there is an underlying TFT, this one here, whose word identities give you this, okay? But I don't want to, again, I don't want to start from that theory. I want to start with abstract formulation because once I have this abstract structure here, I can build this action here, which is n plus one quantization. This is an AKZ theory, n plus one quantized, okay? But the previous one looks exactly the same. That's, hmm. Are there more questions or? If not, I can ask you something. Uh, well, one is one comment that maybe you don't need to answer, but um in the category language the a monad inside of the the mod category uh, the module category is it, it is an associated uh, associative unit algebra so it fits uh, well of course inside the must be the r modules and also in the aks language the you don't need to do like defect tft if you have an infinite dimensional uh, target space because that will give you an infinite dimensional Hilbert space that was uh, shown by Grigorev, I think. But that's just a comment for the guys. But also, the I have a question. When you say, maybe I will be able to read it in your new, next paper with the guys. But uh, when you say solving singularities like BTC or Schwarzschild singularities, you mean solving uh, spin two by tensor singularities for the case of Churchill? And what you mean by solving singularities yeah, yeah, yes. like BTC, like yeah. Because there is no byte. So, so let me also throw in my comment on this. So indeed, the, so so what Grigory? So clearly, I mean this algebra V here, the original one I started from. Okay. Uh, 
this algebra in is, yeah. is infinite itself is infinite dimensional and it could be generated by finite number of letters okay suppose i have just an ordinary particle in two dimensions right mm -hmm. just q and p that theory the, it has a finite number of local degrees of freedom right because to solve quantum mechanics we impose boundary conditions in the two-dimensional phase space Okay. But those are but this, the operator this algebra is then infinite dimensional. It induces an infinite dimensional second quantized theory. Yes, I think yeah, that's but, what people mean all the time. But yeah. the 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 infinite dimensional, the, yeah, the the, the the target space is is not made out of the unfolded fields, right? Is is for the differential or for the unfolded field? When you say that infinite dimensional algebra uh, is made out of so, the field so, itself, or yeah, so so I did, I don't put it here because it would, but this. This the vertex operators. You can think of think of an ordinary string. You have a, you have a target space which is like uh, R n, okay, with the metric on it. So you have n coordinates x mu, okay. Now you build the vertex operators composites. I was planning to put composites here actually, the composite operators. So you have a small number of uh, fundamental variables that you can build, you know, long operators from. Okay, they form an algebra. Okay. okay. That's that. So you can have an infinite dimensional algebra being produced by finite number of coordinates. So that means that this theory, when I wrote here, the infinity theory in V here, that means that V itself, I didn't put it, I, these are on slides further down, but V itself is omega of M tensor some internal infinity Frobenius algebra. Okay? okay. So you take, you take some manifold that's non-commutative, you put forms on it, you expand the forms out. You introduce a class of symbols. That's an infinite dimensional algebra already. Okay. Yeah. And then you make it bad. Right? Yeah. So, you, but that manifold can be finite dimensional. For example, take Vasiliev's theory. You are in four dimensional space. Time cross a four dimensional twist of space. Roughly speaking, you have like eight, maybe twelve. Okay. Generating elements. Okay. Call them x mu y. Okay. These finitely many, they can generate an infinite dimensional set of uh, operators, of course. Okay. Yeah. But and that's how you get infinitely many degrees of freedom. So the infinitely many forms that I think you, if you want to make this statement here that you need local degrees of freedom, where did I put that? Somewhere. If you want local degrees of freedom, that just means that on my manifold where my, my action is after all in the end, that, that bilinear form is going to be a trace or an integral. You're going to integrate over something, which is some manifold M, let's say. Yeah. So at every point, uh, oh, sorry, you want to attach infinitely many degrees. So at, at, at a given point, you need infinitely many integration constants. Okay. Then you have a local degree of freedom in my vocabulary. Yeah, but, but you, you know, can use if, boundary states also. But mm. but if you have if if B is infinite dimensional, uh, for instance, if you have cardinality, I mean, if if if, if it's a countable infinite dimensional, then mm -hmm. the dual the dimension of the dual will be bigger than two to the dimension of B. So it will be something it's very like good for, Exactly. So when, when we have this philosophy, exactly, it becomes really much more infinite indeed. I think it's called, dual. I think the, the, the number is called Beth Omega of B or something like that. We can read literature, but yeah. it's, I mean, it's so indeed, gigant, so, gigantic. Yes. So, my, but it's important to keep in mind that these are the, 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 the coordinates. I mean, the set, but then you have to build observables like maps from this space to the real numbers, which are gauge invariant maps. Okay. Yes. So that, that takes down, I mean, uh, there, there are not that many left in them. And it could be that if you go to sufficiently high level, there are fewer and fewer gauge invariant quant because I, okay, maybe I could stress it here also that it's the cohomology that matters really here at some point, okay? okay? So these vertex operators are already kind of, it's not just an arbitrary function of the generating elements. It has to have some, you know, it has to be gauge invariant with respect to the first quantized theory, okay? So there are okay. first quantized gauge, Symmetries have to impose, and then you extract your vertex operator algebra. So it's not just an arbitrary function of that. You know, the previous layer had its own V dual. This V here are functions of that previous V dual, not arbitrary functions. They have to be invariant under gauge transformations of the underlying system. Okay. Yeah. So there is some kind of competition, if you put it that way, between wanting to include more and more and more stuff and wanting to throw away stuff. And that, of course, has to do with the kind of topologies or, you know, and this is, of course, an interesting issue. I mean, my, it's just my guess, you know, that at some point it will go down again. You know, it's like you go up like an empire and you will come. I mean, at some point, maybe a fork quantization, it will go down. And you, there you say, oops, I'm back to zero quantization. So now the next layer is my first quantized theory. Okay. That would be a perfect system. Okay. okay. 
Yeah, it's so, like uh, uh, totally self-consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there no question? Otherwise, of course, we, we never stop, right? I mean, if this is my yeah. principle, you can say be paired, then you have to go to five, six, seven. Where do you stop? Your theory just explodes, you know? Yeah. Where, where should we, you know, where are we in this? So I think that it has to be like that and then. But I don't know, I, you know, I don't know how to do it, if you ask me. But I mean, that's just, you know, otherwise yeah. I don't, these if ideas I, become, yeah. yeah. If you can surely answer my question about if you are solving the spin two singularity for the case of Churchill and what kind of singularity. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, there, I mean, the spin two singular, the wild tensor singularities in black holes, we all know, right? I mean, they're like one over R cube. They are in properties of this symbol here, yeah? I mean. So it's yeah, like you're trying to BTC. take it off. For the BTC, it's different. The BTC background, or which I don't want to call them black hole, really. I mean, sometimes they have horizons, sometimes not. It's better to call them topological vacua, OK? It's just a manifold M with some topology on which you put the monodromy, OK? That's what we have been doing, at least in higher spin. And in fact, what happened in higher spin theory is that the usual BTC uh, black hole, even the one in 3D, OK, the original one, of 30 yeah. years ago, okay? But this that are... one had a particular, to yeah. We extend the topology bit. We actually, we take two standard BTZ black holes. You can extend them spatially with elsewhere, okay? You can do like Malasena's, you know, extended black hole, okay? But yeah. you can also extend in time. So you can go behind the singularity, glue another patch, and then come back before the original singularity. So this we described in the paper with Giao, Carlo, and Rodrigo Aros, how to do the BTZ3 black hole in this spirit, so to say. And then we can do a BTC4, okay, in the same way. Now, why did we do it this way? Because, the I can go back to the first slide, it's all here. These perturbations, uh, I'm going up here. So this, in that case, the, I mean, this is the black hole in that case, okay, if you want. The whole, this is the monodromy and this, okay. The perturbation here actually lives naturally on that extended topology. You see, the BTZ black hole, there's an initial and a final singularity, but the perturbations of higher spin fields just go through the, 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 the singularity. They don't care, okay? Yeah. There's no vile tensor there. It's a, it's a causal structure that becomes weird. It's a trapped yeah. circle, actually, okay? Yeah, okay. They per also in four uh, dimensions. Yeah, and, and the perturbations simply live on a bigger map. So unless you want to brutally just cut the evolution or the motion, you simply let it move, but then it comes back from below, okay? Yeah. Okay. So this I is what we distressed, okay? Yeah, I, don't, I want to comment more because, but because Matthias has one question, I think that we are mm -hmm. the last one. Hola, Bayer. Thanks but, for the talk. Hello, Matthias. Yeah, I have a navy question. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if, if you really need a string theory in higher spin. I mean, I know that there are a couple of papers of string theories, uh, Gopa Kumar that tries to show that string theory is kind of, the states from string theory can be uh, re uh, treated as a high spin theory. Uh, but I'm not really sure that you actually need the string theory as a higher spin guy. I don't know if you have a comment. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that. no. I I, what I need is what I have here in my slides. So I need maybe this, uh, uh, event on, you maybe need a one plus one dimensional TFT. That I'm, I need, okay? at least to think of Vasiliev, okay? If I want to think calmly with, uh, let's say, with at least one pisco about Vasiliev, you need this, okay? Because you start thinking, wait a minute, his non commutative geometry must come from something underlying. So you need a string there, but that's a topological string, okay? That string, when it has disk topology, all the degrees of freedom live on the boundary. And that boundary is actually the world line of this conformal particle. I didn't write it here, but- Yeah, but per, uh, the, there. the Matthias question, I think, but what Baba Kumar is trying to answer is based on ADSCFT because if you go to yeah, the yeah, yeah. I mean, we, don't need, no, we don't need the number gotas thing for sure. No, 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 no. But, but if you go, I think because if, if you want to solve ADSCFT and you have ADS5 with super young mills, mm -hmm. then in the free limit of super young mills, you will have some uh, higher spin theory in the ADS side. So that's why Baba Kumar is interested. I think I have a slide here with models. This is, I have many notes here. Let me go to that one. I can answer it by throwing on a. Here, yeah, it's just, it's like just a model chart. Okay. Yeah, it's just that you have to think on the reggae tra trajectory in the case of when you yeah. have a strong G. So that's that's why you need higher spin and spin theory, or but I mean, what you would like. Um, so here, so here, I have this conformal particle. Okay, if you take the conformal particle, you treat it as a first quantized field theory, 
It's actually, it's a particle, it's a world line. You make the world line boundary of a disk. Then you're doing a first quantized field theory in one plus one dimension. You deform. Then you get, this is our claim now, this probianian simon theory, the one I found with Ergin and Nicola, with the super connection. And okay, this is also the extension with Philippe, okay? So you, so you can room around in here, okay? And then you can go down to Vasilia, fraction spin gravity, blah, blah. Okay. But you can come here from a bigger theory. So this is your, this is the Patonic, I call it the Patonic W string in ADS, okay? Uh, so you may say, why? I mean, I can start here and move down. I mean, but I, I suspect that these theories are not UV uh, finite. It's just my, you know, wild guess, okay? If you really try to second, I mean, if you really try to quantize these topology, there are, of course, after all, actions in high dimensions, okay? And there is the fundamental action, the classical action, or the you know, the test star product locality, but there are no, I mean, there are high derivative terms in there, okay? We have the star product. But no one has proven that these are totally well-defined, you know, that I can quantize this V-dual. If you could, Matthias, then I'm totally with you. Yes, we don't need string theory. We can just work from here down, okay? The only, the only the first reggae trajectory. Uh, no, but, but you can come I think, here naturally. I, I think it's the other way around, right? Like a string theory needs higher spin, right? Because if you want to solve ADS-CFT, then you need to prove in every regime, right? And in the a free regime yeah, yeah. also. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But so he, I was actually asking from the point of view of higher spin because uh, I mean, what what Per is showing it's pretty general, right? I, I'm not yeah, sure no, that you actually need it. There is still no connection between higher spin and string. And higher spin theory is formulated by its own, and string theory by its own, and you're trying to connect both via this spectrum. Yeah, probability. yeah, but but that's my question. If you actually need to, no, no I don't think so. No, I, no, you don't need you 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 can. If you want, it's like if you if you want to write down high spin gravity a la Vasiliev as a classical field theory based on an underlying non-commutative geometry, you don't need the string. Okay, you can just write down, you can kick the ladder. That was Rodrigo's question. But when I said I put in brackets void identities, of course I don't need those underlying quantum field theories. I can just extract all the juice from them, and just use it. Okay, I mean, right? I mean, for example, take Sean Simon theory in three dimensions. It is actually a closed string field theory. This Witten's famous work from 94, right? If you write down SUN, Chern Simon theory in three dimensions on a manifold M3, that is a string theory. Okay. You know, it's a famous result. So, of course, but you, we all can formulate Chern Simon theory without that string. We don't need a string to write down Chern Simon theory. Steen rather than others, a quantity. But then you can actually say, but this is actually a string. Okay. So it's a bit like, do you. So I agree with you. For example, I, I can I can start here. For example, Vasilio, I can you know I can start here. I don't even need him, but he is there. I mean, the conformal part does. I mean, that's okay. My conjecture or our conjecture, it is you know it is there. And if you have him, you can obtain it by truncation from these W strings, which are critical strings actually, uh, with, with the number of partners is expected flow. Okay, so they are there, you know, under the carpet. So then my intuition would be well. I mean. If there is an ex natural extension and embedding, uh, this is just a deformation. If there is an embedding here, probably it plays a role, okay? But I don't wanna, I mean, we shouldn't be biased, of course, and you know, it's not that, but again, I mean, so, so if you want to do a precise computation, I would propose, for example, to really quantize uh, these uh, Chen Simon like actions, okay? In non quantum geometry, really try to do the perturbative quantization with vertices and is it a UV, or well, there could be something called UVIR mixing in non-computed geometry, for example. There could be problems here, you see? Yeah. We haven't just looked at yet. And then maybe you have to go up to this level, which is where Gabriel Deal and Gopakumar are working. In fact, I could, I mean, me and Enqvist, we were here already 15 years ago in our string partons paper. I mean, many of these, I mean, these basic ideas that partons is spectral flow and it was already there, okay? And, but we also have W, w symmetries, okay? Which is important. In fact, I have, don't have time here, but, the W symmetries, they become critical precisely for the internal symmetries of this Probianian Simon. The internal symmetries, I mean, it's like Witten's theory, the SUN symmetry of the uh, of Sean Simon is actually an internal symmetry of the open string. It's very similar here. There is a kind of matrix algebra appearing here, and that's an internal symmetry of the Platonic W string, okay? So this is like a package that, well, that's my question. So I will, I, I will, I would think to play a role in the end. But yeah. yes, Matthias, you can just start here. You can write down Harris finger as it is and try to just quantize it as it is. And, you know, just using, you know, the ordered existing operator algebra. Okay. You don't need the, 
you can cut the kick the ladder here okay yeah. yeah and even you have the sitter here which is a big if in a string theory now mm. so okay yeah. I, I think that we can conclude because it's like 2 30 already and some of the guys need to have included. Yeah. so let's thank fed again and thank you guys for being here thank next you. week I, I think we have rodrigo olea next week if you can confirm <laughs>